James chapter 1 is where I'm coming from today. And um, when I, and this is, this is the, the reading from the lectionary, the letter reading, one of the four readings from the lectionary. And when I read this, I was reflecting on Daphne's message last week on being real as a Christian. And as I read this, uh, I had a sense, yeah, James is giving us some qualities here as well of what it means to be real as a Christian. So I'm actually going to read most of the whole chapter of James chapter 1, starting from verse 2 to the end. So I know it's a bit of a longer reading, but let's hang with and let's hear the word from the whole chapter. Hey, Brad, are we able to put that one? Oh, one step, look at that. He's already got it up there. <laughs> so follow along. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for no one for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans, the widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now there is a lot in there, a lot in there, and we won't um, be able to 
address all of that in an expository way today unless we're here for three or four hours and I don't think that's an enticing thought for us all. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm encouraged. <laughs> but what, uh, what is the Lord saying to us out of this as a follow-on from Daphne's message last week? And as I read this, I thought of this. She talked about being real as a Christian. And why is that important? Because when we are reflected as being real, God is effect reflected as being real. Do you think about that? The more people see us as real, as Christians as real, the more real God will be. For faith to be real, God must be real and seen as being real. But see, for many people today, God is not being seen as or experienced or understood or perceived as being real. It's a concept out there. What in, in total um, opposite to all the beautiful words we've been singing today in our worship, the perception that's there is the world is real and God is some sort of distant ethereal concept. What is real is that there are limited resources in this world and, there are, and, and, and it's like cause and effect. You know, we use up our resources, the resources are gone, we are gone. There's a lot of worry about that, preserving, uh, are fearful of, 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 of things economic, of, of, of the environment. People understand what we experience is real. There is poverty, there is richness, that's real. But God is seen and perceived by many as some sort of distant concept, not connecting with the world. But that's not how God sees his world, is it? That's not how God sees his world. We know, we know through our faith that that's not true. We know through our faith and our experience of God that he is very real and he is not separate from this world, but he is very present in in this world and the heart of God is that the limits of this world not be the limits for his humanity the heart of God is that not this be a closed system and the man upstairs is someone out there the heart of God that we heard in here is this that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. The heart of God is those who trust, those who endure in this world will receive the crown of life. In other words, will share in Him, with Him forever in eternity beyond the limitations of this world, beyond the heartaches of this world, beyond the troubles of this world, beyond the finite nature of this world. There is an infinite relationship of love and grace and truth and purpose in the one who created this world. That is the reality from God's point of view and that is the reality that Jesus made known to the world. Jesus made God real. Jesus, when he came to earth, broke out of that perception of a distant God out there and made him real. And that was in the heart of God. The heart of God in sending Jesus was that he would not be disconnected from, be seen as being disconnected from his creation, but would be seen as a God who was actively, intimately involved in his creation. That's why we call Jesus' birth through the Virgin Mary the incarnation. God incarnating himself into the mess and the limitation and the struggles and the pain and the limits of this world. The limitless God revealing himself, earthing himself in his creation. And that's why the religious leaders couldn't get their head around it. Because their perception of God was the awe of God but not the intimacy of God. The awe of God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God out there. And that's why they could not 
I get their head around Jesus being the Messiah because he was so ordinary, he was so earthy, he had no respect for their religion. How could he be God? And yet that's the very reason why so many people were attracted to him. That's why so many people who were excluded from the religion of the day, which wasn't real to them, the orphans, the widows, the sick, the, the infirm, the, uncl the unclean, the ones who didn't have the right birthright, the ones who weren't born in the right socioeconomic group or the right cultural or ethnic group were excluded from this God and Jesus made him real to them. Jesus made him real to them. How did he make him real to them? Everything Daphne talked about last night through listening, through caring, through breaking out of the, 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 the um, status thing that this world imposes and just coming and listening and loving and caring. Jesus made God real. And he calls us to follow him. He calls us to go and make disciples. In other words, your call and your commission of those who've come to know his love and greatness and, 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 and presence through the Holy Spirit. A call to make that known because when Jesus left this planet, as we know, the word that Jesus promised would happen, happened. God poured out his spirit on all flesh. So when Jesus left to return to the Father, he is still present here. The Holy Spirit is still here on earth everywhere. And what he is looking for is those who will say, I follow Jesus so that Spirit can dwell within that's what it means by being born again born anew and now the holy spirit has a body or bodies collectively a body to continue to make jesus real to make god real to the world that's the call of the church when the church just becomes another religious institution and and james in that last passage means religion in a different way than we do when the church just becomes a religious institution that is perceived as having membership limitations that makes god unreal and distant again but when we see ourselves as carriers of his presence when we see ourselves as a body that encapsulates the presence and the power of God and therefore the heart of Jesus and the character of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, that's when we make God real to others. And the reality, the earthiness that Jesus reflected when he walked the earth will be real again. God broke out of that closed system and broke in with his presence and we're called to reflect him as being real that others too may know that in the midst of all of their facing all of the trials all of the struggles there is hope beyond that so let's anchor this now how do we do it let's get to the how I just want to recap last week, Daphne gave us some great strategies for being more real in how we respond. Just to recap, remember she said, Daphne said, that the three needs of all people to feel safe, to be heard, and to be accepted for who we are. So what more can we learn from James in this opening chapter of how we can be real or reflect more of the reality of Jesus? Now, in answering that question, I believe there's an overarching theme or an anchor or a framework that James gives us here, and these are found in verses 22 to 25. I'm going to read it again. 
this is what I believe is the, the anchor or the overarching framework of being real. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Be doers of the word and not hearers. In other words, when this word is seen and experienced, when people experience that as lived out in our life, as acted out in our life, not just heard and not just amens on Sunday, but when people see this word living out through us, it will reflect the reality of God in our lives. What does he say? The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, the one who not only believes in faith that this word is living and active and brings liberty, but perseveres, he will be blessed. So being real is about being a doer of the word, not just a hearer. What's then the key difference between doing and hearing? A word that James uses several times here. Perseverance. How many times do we hear the word steadfastness or perseverance in this passage? Perseverance at what? Let's go back to the start of the chapter because I want to get down to some specifics. Okay. A profile of a doer of the word according to James. A doer of the word is someone who can remain steadfast in times of trial. Someone who can persevere in times of trial. What does he say? Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then, again in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for he is stood the test of time. Remaining steadfast. Having no trial or being perceived to have no trial will not make God real. In other words, if we believe we have to hide our problems from people and, 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 and give the impression that we don't have a care in the world, that won't reflect God as real. But when in the midst of the trials, in other words, when people see us struggling with the same things that they are struggling with, but remaining firm and steadfast and trusting through those, that will be, wow, a sign. That will be a sign there's something in this. That will be a sign there's something I have that I don't. See, when James says, can it all joy, he's not meaning a happy, 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 all the time happy. When in the ETH we're worried, we're fearful, we're burdened and that, that put on the happy front. That's not real. But rather what James is referring to is that deeper joy. That deeper joy that's beyond a happy feeling. Sometimes we can cry tears and still know a deeper joy. It's that deeper joy of knowing that nothing this world throws at us will have the last word. That deeper joy of knowing that well, whatever happens here, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's that joy that transcends an emotion, but an experience born out of faith in knowing that God is true to his word. So when we persevere and don't give up, when as times, and uh, as we heard in that song, when we don't feel God close, when we feel distant, when we feel overwhelmed, when our heart is overwhelmed, but continue to press into him in faith, not because we feel it, but in faith, that will be more of a testimony to others than we realise. Because they will see that we're not flitting around. If we're just seen as, yep, wow, Jesus saved me and go to church and the next thing we're in a heap and giving up and disillusioned and 
given up on the faith thing, given up on the Christianity thing. And, and then, you know, we get a touch from the Lord and we're back again. And, um, and then the minute we get troubles and that, ah, give up, God's not with me and give it up all on the old. Why would anyone want to sign up for that? Why would anyone want to sign up for that? Just as people wouldn't want to sign up for someone who's always happy, 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 happy. And you know, read down, they're not. They're not being real. But when people see us being real, when people see us moving through the joys and struggles of life, and yet knowing, yet will I trust in God, that's a sign to others that there is something or someone within us that's driving us, that inspiring us, that we are drawing strength from and they'll want more of it. So a doer of the word is someone who remains steadfast in trials. What else does James say? What's another part of a, a characteristic of a doer of the word? He goes on to say, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed in the wind. Okay, here is another example of a doer. Trust God, ask him for wisdom, and believing that when we ask, we will get it because it's coming from the Holy Spirit. But then, when you ask for wisdom and you don't feel any different, or you don't get your answer you want, or you don't get any answer, or you don't feel you've got any answer, then don't doubt and think, well, that didn't work. I'll do my own thing. But rather, it's trusting that because we've asked, Jesus is true to his word, ask anything in my name. The word of God is true, where if we lack wisdom, ask, believe that it will come. I don't love a number of times where I've asked for wisdom and nothing seems to have come. And nothing seems to have come and nothing seems to have come. But can I ask, are any others like me, that's happened... And then you look back at how an event transpires and you think, wow, this is an outcome beyond what I ever could have imagined. Has anyone else been able to testify to that? Yeah. Okay. So the wisdom, when we ask for wisdom, it doesn't necessarily come. It's not a matter of, Lord, I ask you for wisdom and then go outside and look for the writing in the sky. Sometimes we want that. Now, God's able to do that and sometimes it does come. Sometimes we do get promptings. Sometimes we do get revelation. Sometimes we do get our moments and we think, Lord, that must have come from heaven because that was not within my thinking. Sometimes it comes that way, but when it doesn't come that way, when we feel nothing, that doesn't mean that God has gone on vacation that day it just means that his thoughts are wiser than ours. His ways are higher, as Isaiah said to us. And he knows, see, sometimes God withholds giving us the answer at the time we ask because he knows we can't handle the answer at that particular time. He knows more than we do what he can release to us. And we have to trust him with that because he created us. We think we can handle it. And that's why the enemies got in there with all this clairvoyance nonsense. How much has that screwed people's lives up? That stuff's very real. They think it's a game. That stuff's very real. But it is not God's power they're tapping into. That's a power of the enemy to deceive. People think they want to know the future and then they hear stuff and it messes up their lives. God is far wiser than that and sometimes his wisdom is to release to us when out of his love for us what we are ready to hear and receive. But we have to trust him with that. When we're seen as trusting and then sometimes we'll ask God, we believe we've got God's wisdom and then we do something and then it mucks up. Has anyone else that happened to? Okay. It seems to have mucked up. Now, there's a number of things from that. God works in the muck up 
or when we got the wisdom from God, it filtered through our stuff and it got skewed in how it came out. There's a number of ways to do it, but this is, that's not the point. This is the point. When it doesn't turn out what we want, don't give up, Lord. We trust you. Your word is real. Your word says we ask for wisdom, so we do. That will be more of a testimony to us being real as a Christians and the reality of God when we don't doubt but continue along the line. There is so much that we cannot understand within the confines of our mind. When we see the Lord face to face, all will reveal. I've got lots of questions I want to ask the Lord that I don't understand, that I don't get when I see him face to face. The trouble is when I'm there, none of them will matter anyway. But that's the reality. There will be a time when we will be in the presence of perfect truth. But this side of eternity, it is filtered through the limitations of humanity, of our, our, our limited sinful humanity. So to Sometimes we will get it wrong, sometimes it will be skewed, but it doesn't take away from the fact that God says we ask him of wisdom. His word is faithful and true. And when people see us remaining faithful, even when things go wrong, even when we get it wrong, when we get it wrong, that is not a testimony against God. I've heard Christians say that, oh, what a horrible witness I am when this happened and this happened with my finances or this happened with my family. And I feel condemned and withdraw from people because my um, situation isn't reflecting what a good Christian situation could. That is nonsense. That is a lie of the enemy. That is not a bad testimony to God. What is a bad testimony? As someone who says, yeah, I'm claiming it by faith. And, oh, that didn't work out. Well, you know, God let me down. I come back again and, oh, Lord, I'm believing you. Oh, it didn't happen. Well, God's not with me today. That is the thing that says it's unreal and that does not reflect the reality of God. But rather someone who asks God then does not doubt, even with the ebb and flow of the challenges, even with the ebb and flow of our frail humanity, that will be more of a witness to us being real and therefore the fact that, wow, their faith, that my faith, the faith of that person must be real. You getting this? This is, a, this is a doer of the word. Okay, what's another sign, a profile of a doer of the word? A doer of... <laughs> what's a doer? Oh, dear. I've any words now. A doer of the word. Sorry. You probably know this already, but, but sometimes my brain gets ahead of my mouth. Have you noticed that? <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, where do I get to? Yeah. Verses 9 to 11, have a look at this. But let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. All right, what's the profile here of a doer of the word? Genuine humility. Genuine humility is a sign of being real and that God is real. Okay, let's say what these verses are not saying. James is not against rich people, nor is God. That's not what he's saying here. When he says, but rather when he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, what James is saying here is in the economy of God, in the community of God, the status thing, socioeconomic status, does not convey status in the eyes of God. In other words, all he's saying is everyone is on a level playing field in the, in the economy of God and in the eyes of God and in the heart of God. God's not against rich. God loves rich people who are generous and use what they have to bless him. How many rich people do we know use what they have to extend the kingdom of God? There are rich people who are a blessing to God and there are rich people who are cursed to God. There are poor people who are a blessing to God and there are poor people who are cursed to God. It's not about the amount of money. It's about heart. It's about attitude and what we do with it. What James is saying here is when we in the kingdom of God are on a level playing field 
when we do not distinguish from people, do not judge people, do not distance ourselves from people on the basis of their socio-economic position, that's a sign there's something different here because the world hates that. How many people in the world do they feel judged? Do they feel not good enough because of that? But when they see in the life of the Christian community those with a lot and those with little in terms of monetary things, loving each other, caring for each other, there for each other on the same playing field. That's genuine humility. Not only in the part of the rich who are humble, but on the part of the poor who are exalted. Okay, it's false, you know, that's having a dig at the poor as well because it's false humility to say, well, I haven't got some, those who don't have as much spend their time looking with a grass as green mentality and distinguishing themselves. Whereas to be able to allow themselves to be exalted and be the same, that in itself is every much an expression of humility as to be humble down. So that expression expresses a, real, expresses a reality that people really want to see. Because they're sick of the class stuff in the world. They're sick of the consumerism. They're sick of watching ads on TV that you'll be happy if you drive a, a, this car or wear this outfit there. And, and it doesn't bring happiness. And true joy and fulfilment and hope, that comes from genuine community among people where they're loved, accepted, feel safe where they are. When we do that, we reflect a God who's real. All right, what's another one? One more. Now, this is reiterating what Daphne said last week. There are these words that we find in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's reiterating Daphne's point last week when real, when people feel they're heard, you know, and we're not running ahead and thinking about what we want to say back to them, but are really listening to them. When we are positioned more to listen rather than feel we have to be heard in relating to others. When we do that, there'll be others who will listen to us as well. And to be able to spend time really listening and getting to know people. Without an agenda to convert them, without an agenda to impose our wisdom, but to listen. To not react to situations in other words, because we haven't heard it. Take the time, stop, listen. It's the old make sure brain is engaged before putting mouth into gear saying that's been around for ages, but it's more than that. It's listening to the Spirit of God within. So let's look at some of these again. These are the simple things. To be remain steadfast in times of challenge. I hope this is liberating, not, not, not um, imposing a burden, that it's okay to be able to know we're burdened. We're facing, for others to know that we're facing challenges. But to remain steadfast in those times. To ask and trust for wisdom and don't doubt in spite of the answer. To show genuine humility. To know the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's a level ground in God's economy. And to be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. Now there's a lot more there. But if we can just embrace these things more, people will see more of a reality of a Christian, it will break through the negative perceptions of Christian and church and religion that we Daphne referred to last week. It'll break through that. And that sense of real relationship will bear testimony 
to a God who breaks out of that perception of someone who's distant and unreal. This is real evangelism. People say I'm not an evangelist because you're not the personality to hand out tracts on street corners. And, you know, there are people who do that really well, whose personality and gifting and calling and do it really well, and there are Christians who do it because they feel they have to because this is the way of evangelising. And I'm in any way, any way, um, casting negative on anyone who has that gift and shares their faith. Go for it. But realise this is where evangelism becomes real for us. Where we live this out, be doers of the word, not just hearers. Let's continue. And... and to be those who reflect the reality of God. Let this be a safe place to be real about our ups and downs, our joys and our challenging times. And in that reality, celebrate God working, transforming, renewing, preparing us for the greater experience of his kingdom that is to come. But us for now reflecting more of his reality in this world, in this kingdom, in this life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your abiding presence within us and through us in this time. Thank you, Father for the privilege that we have to reflect your reality to others, to celebrate your presence and to share through our lives your abiding, grace-filled, hopeful presence to others. Lord, give us the courage to just be able to be real. Give us the assurance that in the ebbs and flows of our normal life, you are there. And release faith for us to remain steadfast and firm, knowing that you are true to your promise, Lord. That when we remain steadfast, when we've stood the test, we will receive the crown of life. What a gift. What a God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.